previously on Family. Every man must look himself in that mirror, uh, whether he like it or not, and hold himself accountable. I knew going into my senior year, it was either MEAC championship or bust. Coming in, I didn't understand like the responsibilities that come with like being like a so-called like the best player. Going through that struggle, going through that fire day in, day out, maybe not getting the wins that we thought we would early on, I think it prepared us for what happened later on this season. After two consecutive MEAC tournament wins, the Eagles again found themselves in unfamiliar territory as they went 9-7 in league play and went to Norfolk as the number six seed. In that tournament against Coppin State, the first game, uh, which ended up going in as the lowest scoring first half in MEAC tournament history. <laughs> what was the score? I mean, it was it was 18 to 17 Coppin State at block. halftime. <laughs> yeah, I mean, how did you get that team to, to fight through? It was late. Reggie Gardner Jr. made a three that really turned the tide. But how did you really get that team to get through that first game before going forward? It was going to be that type of game with that team. We just struggled to score. Like we, it wasn't, we were shooting bad. Or, no, we just struggled to score. We really weren't as talented offensively as the teams in the past. You know, I could just throw the ball out there and they go get a bucket. We had guys that could just say, coach, just everybody get out the way, I got this. That team didn't have that. And that's what made it even more challenging to coach. And, you know, some of the guys we thought would provide that for us, you know, for whatever reason, it just, it just didn't happen. Um, so for us to be, down one during the MEAC tournament. I, I would like to say we had them right where we wanted them, you know what I'm saying? Because we we just didn't have a lot of talent at that time. But And Coppin was great defensively. And, and, you know, once you play another team in the tournament, the scores tend to decrease a little. Um, the margin of error decreases a little. And you just know, like, one possession, it's going to boil down to one possession. And uh, regardless of the score, it's going to boil down to one possession. And you got to be mentally tough enough to get to that possession and fight until things go your way. And I think that's what we did. To be honest, looking back on it, that's one of my proudest moments is winning that game. Because, yes, it was an ugly game. It was, it was probably really disgusting to watch, to be honest, if you weren't, if you weren't in it. But when you were in it, it was, it was my type of game. To me, it was an NC Central type of game. It was all about toughness winning each possession late in the game to separate because that separation wasn't going to come from pretty basketball. It wasn't going to come from hitting nice threes or, you know, beautiful layups or any of that. It was just dog, it was a dog fight. It was a, it was a, a fight with a basketball. And that's what Coach Mono always talks about, a street fight with a basketball. That's what that game versus Cobham State was. And it just gave me a lot of confidence to know that we could win a close game and that this tournament it wasn't going to go the same way the regular season did, that's for sure. That game was tough, and then it's Savannah State in the quarterfinal, um, a team that was known to put up a bunch of points, and you went up and down the floor with them at their place. Um, Rashawn Davis ends up turning his ankle at some point during that game, and he comes back and still puts up 20 rebounds in that game. Um, what do you remember about that Savannah State win? The time that we played them in the regular season, I... I nudged one of my coaches and I said, we're not going to win this game, although we could. And I saw the way they played as it, they played a funky, funky style. Like it was unorthodox. But I said, we can win this game tonight. I said, but we're going to see this team again. So I don't want to adjust now. I'd rather adjust in the MEAC tournament. 
And I told our guys at halftime, I said, listen, man, just continue to execute the game plan that we presented you right now. And after the game, I told them, we're going to see them again. We're going to make our necessary adjustments, and we're going to beat this team again. And we were interested in playing them. I, got, I was really looking forward to it, um, you know, in the MEAC tournament. And um, I, I knew everything was going to come down to one possession, but I knew – if you don't allow them to go up and down this floor, um, I didn't think they could beat you because I didn't think they shot the ball great. I think they just shot it a lot. So if you minimized um, the volume of shots that they had and put game pressure on them, it would be a different type shot when, when they had to take it. And that's what happened. I thought they tightened up a little bit down the stretch. Our guys uh, stepped up and made some plays and um, you know, Raekwon Harney and C.J. Wiggins were, was huge for us, uh, you know, that game. And I remember them missing a three-point shot that really was very similar to the three-pointer that Norfolk missed. I had the same angle, you know, and I, I knew it was off when they shot it. And um, when I saw that, I was just happy that we advanced. You know, I'm blessed, and, you know, I like to give thanks to God. You know, I thank God all the time for, like, you know, everything he's given me, my abilities and everything like that. So, I mean, when I'm out there, I'm just playing. So... You know, after the game, I'm not really, you know what I'm saying, concerned with, you know, what I did individually. So, you know, I never really look at what I do like other people do. Like, you know, if, like sometimes it'll like people will hit me and be like, you know, like it's crazy like what you be doing. But it'd be like with me, it's just like, you know, me. So I, I can't really see like what other people be seeing. So it's kind of weird. It took two gritty wins to get the Eagles into the semifinals. And after defeating Morgan State 79 to 70, NCCU prepared to face Hampton, a team that defeated the Eagles 86-70 earlier in the year inside McDougald McLennan Arena. And the matchup didn't only happen with a championship on the line. It was also more or less a home game for the Pirates, whose campus is right across the Chesapeake Bay from Norfolk. The championship game was um, versus Hampton that year was unbelievable because if you remember early on in the season, they came into our place uh, on the nationally televised game and they they beat us pretty bad, and I remember after that game, you know, Coach Morton sort of challenged us, can we beat a team that has guards like that? And when we matched up with him again in the championship, I wanted to prove to him that, you know, we got guards too, and we can win this game. So to go out there as, you know, pretty heavy underdogs and to beat a team as talented as that Hampton team was, was just a culmination of all the work we put in throughout the season. It was all worth it again, the adversity, the amount of losses we had to take on early in the season, some tough road trips, even that initial loss to Hampton in the regular season. It made us prepared for that ultimate fight in those bright lights when things aren't necessarily going to go the way you planned it, but you have to adapt and overcome, and that's what we did as a team. And It just meant, it meant the world to me to be able to help in, in some small way in that game. The two championships in North Carolina Central had won. They'd done as a one seed in the tournament. You get to, to the championship game as a number six seed and you win it. How special was that for you? Extremely special because, you know, that's when you really know you've done it against all odds, like all odds. No one in their right mind expected us, you know, to be in that situation. And I think everyone that chalked it up, if, especially if you followed us, you saw the good, the bad, and the uglies. And sometimes the bad and the uglies far outweighed the good. Um, so you just say, hey, they won it the last couple of years, so they okay right now. Just give them a chance to rebuild. But in our locker room, I was like, look, we're going to win this thing. All you have to do is just listen. And I told those kids that a thousand times. Let us put together a game, great game plan for you to come out here and just listen and you guys just execute it. And when things go around, we'll call time out and we'll do something else. But just promise me you'll stay locked in together, you'll stay mentally tough and you'll listen. And they did that and, you know, the rest is history. For the second year in a row, the Eagles went to Dayton, Ohio to participate in the first four, this time around against the SWAC champion, Texas Southern. Rashawn Davis collected a double-double of 19 points and 11 rebounds, and Pablo Rivas secured a game-high 12 rebounds with 7 points, but the Tigers got the better of the Eagles, 64-46. You go to the NCAA tournament your first time through, and you get a double double on the national stage against Texas Southern. Um, what was that experience like for you? Uh, it was crazy. Uh, it was like no other. The atmosphere anytime in March Madness is just different. It's just a different atmosphere. Um, it's a different beast, 
And um, honestly, it was an amazing time, even though we lost. Um, you know, I just I learned a lot that year. And then not not only but that year, but you know that last little home stretch and that 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 first four game last year, I learned a lot. And what what I took from that game, what I learned from that game, I tried to bring it to this year. With the 2017-18 season in the rearview mirror, the Eagles prepared for the 2018-19 season with a chance to make history. 2018-19, you roll in and ahead of this team, you put in front of them and said, you have a chance to do something that's never been done before here, to win three straight championships, and you bring back a lot of the core from that championship. What was it like in your mind preparing for the 18-19 season? It didn't start off how I wanted it. I thought we came back um, fat and happy. I thought our NCAA game was in, I thought we should build upon the NCAA game. I thought, you know, we didn't have half the talent that Texas Southern had and they, they beat our butts and let us know that. So I was hoping that our guys would go home and let that remain at the forefront of their workouts and, and understand why we're working out. But they went home and at the forefront of their minds was the MEAC championship. And I got it, I understood it because they, they went against all odds and they've overcome some adversity. But when they got back on campus, I didn't like the approach. I didn't like the mentality. I thought everyone was content with just winning last year. We had to shake things up once again. And again, it always goes back to whoever's doing what I asked them to do on a consistent basis, that's who's gonna play. That's who's gonna gobble the minutes. I don't care if you're a star preseason player of the year, a former star, I don't care. You know, I care about the now. What are you doing right now? And um, we had to shake up some lineups and then we had to overcome some injuries. And, you know, we were able to do that. And even though our schedule was tough for the non-conference season, I thought we had some spurts where we really, really played well. And I said, man, if we can put this together over an extended period of time, i.e. 40 minutes, then I thought we could be really good. Your personal journey, you join as a walk-on, you have two championships, and not just that, you became a starter during that second year. And then you come back for your senior year, and now you're somebody that has to step in and be a leader for this team. What was it like transitioning fully into a role as a as an upperclassman, as somebody who has started games and has that experience? Uh, what was your mindset over that summer before the next year started, before eighteen nineteen? Yeah, you know, it's sort of surreal for me because the journey happened so quickly. And if you're looking from the outside, you might just think that bang, 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 it sort of happened like that. And now he's a starter. Now he's a team captain. But really, there's a lot that goes into that. And in order to be successful, you have to prepare. So that summer I knew I had to be ready to lead. And in order to do that, you have to be the one who goes first. You have to be the one who's put in the work so that you have the respect of the team. The same way I respected the Dewan Graffs of the world, Pat Cole, in my first year. So I really just focused in on how can I be at my best so that these guys can look up to me and get on with the program and we can take it a step further and do what this school hasn't done before in winning three championships, which was the goal the whole summer. All I thought about was, how can we get this third one in a row? John is probably the hardest working person that I've probably met. His work ethic is just makes you, like he's not the most talented out of the bunch. This is not the most skilled, but he will like literally die before somebody outworks him. And when you have a, a guy around you like that, it's nothing but success waiting to happen for for you. Like it's like and I realized that early that maybe my work ethic is not, you know, as high as his. So if I keep this guy around, what is that gonna do to me? It's gonna raise my work ethic. You know, looking at a guy like that and respecting something like that, you know, and just him being as a person. He's just a great person, you know, not even just talking basketball. Just me and John just had so many conversations about different things. I asked him a lot about his background, and he's from Long Island. So it's like I'm from Newark, and he's from Long Island, so it's like that up-top connection. And it's just like that's just he, he was probably, for me personally, um, and even the team's success, he probably was the biggest piece my senior year. I can't even, you know, like make that up. Like he probably really was the biggest piece of our championship run. 
NCCU played well in the regular season against MEAC opponents, and the Eagles went 10-6 to finish with the number three seed. NCCU played its season finale on the road against North Carolina A&T, and with the Eagles on pace to finish third, it appeared the Eagles and Aggies were on pace to meet for a second time in seven days, this time in the semifinals of the MEAC tournament. The regular season has its ups and downs. You go to the tournament as the number three seed, and you know that you have a chance to face North Carolina A&T again, as you, you fell to them both times in the regular season. Opening round game, you go out and you put your best performance in against Delaware State, and then it's North Carolina A&T for the third time that year. What'd you tell the team in the locker room before that semifinal matchup? You know, it was very similar to the speech um, about Savannah years ago. We played A&T, we were playing them at their place to finish the regular season. And I told our staff, I said, they're really good, but I don't think they would do well against, if we did this, I don't think they'll respond well. I said, however, I already looked at the brackets. They'll probably finish second, we'll probably finish third, which means we'll play each other next week. So I'm not gonna show them that now. You know, I said, so again, we gotta go ahead and be vanilla and play our best. And I didn't like the last regular season game and they, they beat us, but we had like a 10 day break. Like I didn't even know how to manage that time. So, so I had to get the guys' spirits and, and, and bodies readjusted to, um, you know, what was at hand. And so entering the tournament when we played a and I thought we did, a, we threw a lot of things at them that they hadn't seen before. And um, I don't think they adjusted well during that time, and I saw the confusion on their faces. Uh, to their credit, they fought hard and they came back and, you know, bust, bust us in our mouth and made us taste our own blood a little bit. But our guys were resilient throughout, and uh, we finished the game and we closed it. Honestly, that was probably one of my most, like, favorite games of the year. That was probably my favorite game of the year because, like, um, they, had a, they had a guy, I don't, I'm not familiar with his name or anything like that, but he was a big, strong guy. And, like, you know, all they had him in there to do was to lean on me. And, you know, I felt like the first two games he kind of, you know, he kind of got over on me. So, you know, I, like, I kind of had took it personal, so I made it my business. Like, you know what I'm saying, we're not going to lose this game. So, you know, it was, it was like on that. But, I mean, you know, outside of that, though, you know, my teammates had my back and they, they was looking for me that game, too. So I'm just staying for, you know, Jordan Perkins, you know, Reggie. Everybody that was out there, they was just feeding me the ball that game. So, you know. I had a pretty good game that game, but yeah, I, I took it personal though. I took that one personal. It's, once again, everything hangs on one game. What was your feeling uh, before that game started? Going into the game, you know, in that in that tournament in Norfolk at the Scope Arena, I just feel like it brings out the best in our team, and I, and I think that's a once again that's a testament to Coach Moten and sort of how he prepares us throughout the whole season to always value the possession, that you could win or lose a basketball game in just one possession. So to be honest, I was extremely confident going into that game, even though, yes, once again, we're the underdog. They're uh, playing on essentially their home court, you know, in front of their fans. I still felt very confident because I just feel like our program wins in March. Our program has owned the Scope Arena the past three years. So for me, it was just natural to feel confident and to trust the process that, you know what, I don't know how this game is going to shake out, but I know we're going to come out on top. NCCU faced Norfolk State in the championship for the second time in three years. And just like the previous meetings with the Spartans, it was a thriller. NCCU trailed by 10 at the half, but immediately started the second period with a 12-0 run to pull in front. The Eagles outscored Norfolk State 28-15 in the second half, but NCCU had to hold its breath as the Spartans had a chance to send the game to overtime at the death. So going into the finals, I knew it was going to be an ugly game because the recovery time, I, I thought we got back to the hotel at 1 a.m. from the semifinals and had to wake up at 8, get hit breakfast and do the Scott report. So I was tired as a coach and I hadn't run up and down the floor. So I knew those guys' bodies were tired. So I just said, listen, man, it's, this game is always going to be about who wants it more. No one's going to shoot it great. No one's going to have a bunch of open looks. It's not going to be an um, a offensive clinic and a, a, a great offensive seminar. It's going to go boil down to old school um, 1980s NBA physical basketball and whoever have the last shot and whoever have the last possession has to win that possession and we ended up winning it.
One second for the tie in overtime. No! For a third year in a row, the Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference is maroon and gray. Dance Party Central is back for a third consecutive year. Man, I'm a champion. This is a dynasty. North Carolina Central. All this right here runs through North Carolina Central. We've been doing this a long time. That's the reason I came here. They, they told me to come here and win championships, and that's what I am. Read that right there. Hey, everybody that doubted us, we knew we was going to be right here. That's all we got. That's all we got. That's all we need right here. We're champions, baby. And, uh... <laughs> tournament championship is held in Norfolk, Virginia. Twice you beat Norfolk State, one time you beat Hampton. How hard is it to win at Scope Arena going up against the hometown teams? I ain't never look at it like that till you said it. That, that's, they should give us a, a, another championship just for going through that. But, um, you know, it's always difficult. And, um, you know, we have this mantra now that the standard is the standard around here. And, you know, I said a while back um, that we were like the, the, the Duke of HBCUs. Like you go into an arena and people either love you or they hate you. And um, we've certainly embraced that role of being the villain. And that's what happens when you're not only on the road, but when you're on the road at the MEAC tournament when the stakes is high and uh, you're playing for all the marbles. Sometimes you have teams, and you can see it in the crowd, you have teams that's sticking around just to cheer against us, you know. So the arena's full, but they're really cheering against North Carolina Central. The only people that's cheering for North Carolina Central are North Carolina Central fans. But now you have, um, you know, fans of different teams staying there cheering against us. And at first I was like, what are y'all doing? But we, we've learned to accept that. We've come to embrace that. And... That means you, you've really elevated the program, and that, that means you, you're really about something, and I'll take it. And so to defeat the two quote-unquote home teams um, in the last three years, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a testament to the character of my basketball team, how tough they are and how resilient they've been uh, because things aren't going to go your way, especially on the road in those hostile environments, um, on national television. And somehow or another, the last three years, they found a way to, to fight and fight themselves through and become champions. I remember after the game was over, you said that you never would have to experience the feeling of losing in that building. What does it feel like to be able to finish up your career going 10-0 and in the MEAC tournament? You know, it's, it's really hard to explain to people um, when you win like that, that the feeling of losing is so much worse than how good it feels to win. You just don't want to have that feeling of losing, of going home when you know you could have made it to the tournament if you just won one or two more games. And to never have that feeling of losing in that building is, is really fortunate for me because one of the first things I always see every time, every past three years when we've won is the dejected look on the team who's lost and you just see them crushed. As much as you see our guys celebrating, you see the other team just completely crushed. And to avoid that and to have the feelings of getting, that, getting those wins in those key spots, you know, it's just unbelievable. It's just unbelievable. Three consecutive MEAC tournament championships brought three consecutive trips to the first four in Dayton, Ohio. And it also brought with it a third different opponent as the Eagles faced North Dakota State. The Eagles shot 63% from the perimeter in the second half and held a slim lead with five minutes to go over the Bison. However, North Dakota State hit a few timely three-pointers of its own and left NCCU heartbroken in Dayton once again after a 78-74 final score. So you win the MEAC tournament, you're named most outstanding player, and then you go to Dayton again, and you have a double-double in that game, 20-plus points. What was it like for you, even though, of course, it wasn't a win, but to be able to say that you gave everything you could in the final game that you played here at North Carolina Central? Um, I, it was an honor. You know, it's an honor and a, it's a pleasure to be to be a part of, like, such a legacy, such as um, NCCU. You know, I'm, uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to play here. You know, um, NCCU has given me, like, an opportunity to set, like, the rest of my life up, you know what I'm saying, a positive light. So, you know, I'm forever grateful for that. Yeah, four NCAA tournament appearances. Um, 
of course, your first trip, um, much different than the other three. Um, do you, can you talk a little bit about that first experience and then how the other three have differed in their own right? The first one, I never enjoyed it. Um, you know, my son, I think we, we won it on Saturday. On Monday, my son was in the, a burn center. So that, that stunk, um, you know, personally. Um, I didn't have the opportunity to, to take my family with me. And, you know, I don't even remember nine, ten plays from the Iowa State game. I, I was so worried about getting back here. So I thought we were really good that year. And I thought we could go to the Sweet 16. And I was sitting in the house one night, maybe two weeks prior, and I said, there's only two teams in the country that I probably wouldn't want to face because we don't match up well against. I said, anyone else, I think we defeat. And I said, those two teams, I was watching Iowa State play Kansas. And I said, the two teams that would probably give us fits simply because we didn't match up well was Iowa State and uh, Louisville. And so two weeks later at the selection show, they said, North Carolina Central, 14 seed, and then going to San Antonio, Texas, and they'll play the Cyclones of Iowa State. And I was like, <laughs> right? Like the one team that I felt like, because I thought they were really good. And the reason we didn't match up well, because they were so old and they were so big at every position. Like their point guard was 6'6", and he was like 24, you know? So I just thought they presented us with a difficult matchup. So for the first time in NCAA history for our tournament appearance, I thought we fought. And I was extremely proud of our guys. And I think it was down four or five at the half. Uh, we didn't finish the half the way we were capable of, but um, they had so much fire, firepower on the court in the second half, I thought it just wore us down. And I was extremely proud of our guys. The previous years, you know, uh, it came down to one possession. Um, the the team with Pat Cole, um, I just didn't, I thought we were tight. I thought we didn't make our layups. Like, we missed open layups. The shots that we, I think we might have been four for 20-something from the three-point line. And I just wanted our guys to relax. The year following that, um, we didn't have a chance. Um, you know, our guys was like deers in headlights. And Texas Southern had been there. I think they were like, look, man, we, those kids at Texas Southern, they were, talent-wise, they were better. And I thought we could just learn something. And I thought we could just grind and, you know, try to figure it out. But uh, Trey Jefferson was in incredible that night. And, you know, it was difficult to stop him. And, um, and we shouldn't have been there in the big scheme of things. You know, it's like, okay, you, the C Cinderella done took the glass off a foot now. Y'all can sit down and, you know. And I thought our guys was just happy to be there instead of going out there to keep the legacy going. Um, and then this year, you know, playing North Dakota State, I, again, man, there's no – I will never feel guilty, and we want to win games just as bad as anyone once we get to that point, but I'm not going to feel guilty once we get to that point because there's no bad teams. It ain't no you should win this. No one can ever say y'all should have won this game or, you know, like it's it's going to be, man, it's, it's just going to be a, a matter of attrition throughout the game. And, um, you know, it it's educated our guys, it's educated our fans because – they know now, okay, for us to take this program and, and go to another level, here's what we're going to need. You know, we got to lift more because you can see a difference between their bodies and our bodies and, you know, those things. So it's been an educational process, and it don't feel good. It's uncomfortable while you have to sit in it, but I'm going to trust it, and um, hopefully we'll learn from it and get our first tournament victory soon. And John, um he becomes the first person here at North Carolina Central to be a part of three championship rosters. And for you to be a part of the first uh, championship, although you didn't get to play in the second and third, but to say that you had a part in helping to start something that never happened before here at North Carolina Central, how does that make you feel? Hey, man, it makes me feel great that the success of the program is continuing. Um, just being an alumni, I could go talk to any school like, I mean, any, anybody that went to another uh, college and just tell them, like, hey. And it's people that starting to really know who North Carolina Central is that didn't know before. 
Um, it's crazy because like I go talk to, oh, so you went to North Carolina Central. Oh yeah, I saw you guys playing the first four. This that oh, I like you guys. School your coach, is so swaggy and you know all types of things. And it's just like people are starting to really know who North Carolina Central is because I say that because my sophomore year when I transferred in, people were like you're going where. And then, like to see the flip and to see how that changed now, it's just amazing. And I love it. And I just hope he wins four, five, six. So it just the the school grows and the, everyone know everyone knowing about the school grows. I just hope that continues. And this is something I don't know if you know this or if if you've thought about it at all. But you're the only person that's been on all three of those championship rosters. What does that mean to you when you think about that? I mean, to me, it's a lot to do with the right timing. You know, I, I would be, I'd be ill-advised to say that, you know, we won those three championships because of any individual, whether that was Coach Moen, whether that was any of the players. It's just extremely fortunate, and I'll never forget for the rest of my life that I had the opportunity to be that, that guy who has been on these three teams because all three teams had different identities, and all three teams – had different struggles, different victories, different triumphs. And to be sort of just someone who can be a constant is, it's an honor. And it's, it's an honor you wanted to pay back to the guys who came before you. You know, the biggest thing for me was, I don't want those guys who come to the game, you know, those the CJ Wilkerson's of the world, the Jeremy Ingram's, the Pooby Chapman's, the guys who have left a legacy. You don't want those guys to come to your games and say, you know what, they dropped off. That's the biggest thing, and that really scared me, you know. That really scared me that we may not live up to what they left because they left behind an incredible legacy. So for me to be able to honor that legacy and to sort of hopefully create one of my own has been a complete dream come true because ultimately when you go somewhere, you want to bloom where you're planted. You want to be that person who can, who can uplift the people around you, even in some small way, and I think I was able to do that. So to me, I'm incredibly grateful and it's just been amazing. And you mentioned Coach Moten. What are your thoughts about him and having him as a coach for three years and being able to experience your college athletic career with him? You know, it's really unbelievable because I was a guy who no coach in the country, in Division One, no coach in the country had reached out to me and offered me a spot in their team. So I'll be forever indebted to Coach Moten because he gave me a chance. And not only did he give me a chance, he really believed in me. And that's really what's rare, especially in today's society. Having someone who believes in you when they really don't have to. We had no connections prior to this. He just saw the way I operated, appreciated me, and gave me a great opportunity. So I'll be forever indebted to him because it means the most for a guy who received no looks from any schools in the country to be able to go to a place where they have an unbelievable coach, an unbelievable program that wins and wins consistently and allows you to become a better version of yourself because that's what this program has done for me. I've become a better version of myself throughout the time here. Everybody know like he's a basketball like he's, he like he got a great basketball mind. So you know, just off of that, he's a he's a great coach. But you know, outside of that, I feel like he's a great guy too. You know, like even like you know, as I'm graduating and getting like getting ready to leave here, like he's still trying to do everything he can to help me. So you know, I'm appreciative of that because you know, a lot of times you know schools, you know, after after kids graduate. The coaches probably, you know, won't try to help their kids, like, get a job or anything like that. They'll just, you know, basically kick them to the curb. But, you know, I'm thankful that Mo didn't do that with me. And for you being a player in this program, coaching here for over 10 years now, in your eyes, what makes this program so special? Uh, it was it's, it was special long before I even set foot here. Uh, it, was, it was special when John McClendon touched here. And, you know, I don't even consider myself the – head coach, I just consider myself a caretaker of the program. Um, you know, I had the fortunate opportunity to, to, to meet him on several occasions. And when I was a player, he came to our practices and I couldn't even practice because I knew about the history and I just always had one eye on him. Um, but I thought it was phenomenal what he did, especially during that time when it was the Jim Crow segregation era, um, but still able to um, recruit and still able to uh, not use anything as excuses, but yet establish a program where he um, demands greatness from his players and he raised the bar 
to a standard of excellence. So we just tried to fulfill those shoes. We always take it up a notch. Even if we having a good practice, he gonna always take it up a notch. Like we can never just stay like, you know what I'm saying, like here with it. It's always gonna be, you know what I'm saying, going up, going up, going up. So I feel like, like that's the reason why we win a lot. It's the love that we have for one another. It's, it goes beyond the resources. It goes beyond the resources of the Duke, the UNCs. We, we love each other here. I mean, the bond that we have with our brothers who we fight with every single day, the practices, that's what separates us. Teams don't practice the way we do. You know, Coach Moden holds us to a standard. The standard is the standard. That's a great saying, but we actually live that. There isn't a practice where he's not out on the floor holding us accountable. And I think that's very rare among coaches, especially coaches who could easily say, you know, I've accomplished this, let me relax a little bit. He knows his success is gonna come, but it's like, how do I get these guys from all these different places? Maybe two-year transfer, three-year transfer, uh, under-recruited, over-recruited, uh, never got a shot, and how do I get them to mesh, to come together for one goal? And it's like, none of this success would be possible without that man um, being here. So it all starts with Coach Moe. From McClendon to Mike Bernard to my coach Greg Jackson and uh, I just feel a responsibility to continue to carry it until I can't carry it anymore. What's it like taking the floor and playing here at home? Uh, it's fun. The fans, the fans they get pretty crunk when they come so it's a, uh, it's a, it's a pretty live um, atmosphere. My junior year it was easy. It could have been easy for that gym to be empty as all day because we weren't winning you know like consecutively like the year before so it was like it was kind of tough and we'll still come out and have a crowd, you know? So it was like those fans that just stick with us, is, it makes it real special because it make you want to go out and play even harder the next game for, those, for the fans and for the name behind the arena. I'll never forget my time spent here. I'll never really take it for granted because every single game you go on the court, you know you have a great show in our home. And you know, even when you go on the road, like I've said before, Norfolk, that Scope Arena, has had more central fans than just about any other fans. And to me, that's where we really shine our most. So once again, just an incredible honor. It's just the name behind it. Uh, Coach Moten always talked about us, talked to us about knowing where you, you're, you're standing. Like you can't be in here and not know who that man is. You know what I mean? So it's like, that's really what makes the gym special. Coach, in the postseason this year, there were many teams that had the shooting shirts on the bench that said family, but for this program, that's what the motto was all year long. And looking at the, the program, the team, coaching staff, and the North Carolina Central community, what does family mean to you in relation to this program? Family means everything. Um, family is someone that you may have um, some disagreements with, even some squabbles, but when it's time to depend on that person, you know and that person know that you're gonna be there for each other, having each other back um, unequivocally. And that's what family means to me. It means loving uh, your brother. It means holding that brother accountable. And it means understanding that we're all fighting for one common goal. Not 25 common goals, but for one common goal. And there can't be any individual agendas the individual agendas must be thrown away and the common agenda must be um, championships and being great. And that's what family means to me, man. Like, that's, that's, that's it in a nutshell. All right, is there anything that you'd like to add here at the end about your time here? I mean, it was a good time. You know, I had fun. You know, we, we did it two years in a row. I and my team, my, I, myself and my teammates did it two years in a row. You know, previously my redshirt year, so that makes it three years in a row. So, I mean, you know, it was a wonderful time. You know, it was tough, but it was worth it at the end. So, you know, we got two rings out of it. So, yeah, that's it, man. It was just a great time. Um, it just was great, man. It's, you know, anybody, you know, watching this, I, I just want you and I just want people just to tell a friend about North Carolina Central because it's, a, it's really a beautiful campus. And, you know, the people here are great. And, you know, the sports programs are going to continue to take off. So I just want people to just tell a friend to tell a friend about North Carolina Central. Number one, uh, Coach Moen for a great opportunity. I'd like to thank Dylan Stripe. He was a manager. He's, 
he's the reason I'm here as well. He is the one who contacted Coach Wilson and said, you know, I got a guy. Um, Dylan went to middle school with me and he's believed in me since day one and he's sort of the reason I even had an opportunity initially um, by contacting Coach Wilson, getting me that tryout, allowing me to work summer camps where Coach Monin first met me. I got to thank him. Um, I also want to thank Pat Cole. Pat Cole, as you guys know, is, is and probably the best player I've ever played with on a team. Uh, from a talent perspective, from how he approached the game, without a doubt the best player I've played with. And he believed in me in such a way that I couldn't help but have confidence going forward. Uh, he was there for me that whole first year and he's been there for me ever since. So I want to thank him. I also want to thank my family for um, supporting me in every game and showing up to just about every single game. They were there when I wasn't playing, they were there when I was starting, they were there when I was injured, and they were there for all three championships. So I just want to end by thanking my family, my dad, my mom, my brother, and my sister, as well as my other brother. All right, Coach, is there anything that you'd like to add? Nah, I'm good. Thank you. Go Eagles. <laughs>